I think it's been an interesting class. I hope, uh, for me at least, I hope it has been for you. I can't believe we're at week uh, eight. Is this week eight? Yeah. So there it is. Um, what we're, you can see what we've done here. We started with ritual or rites of passage, then the medicine wheel, and then these various thinkers, and they're an eclectic group. But what they share is a notion of how we become who we are, our stages along life's way. Human development, but human development with a, an eye toward um, the things we're interested in, which is meaning making and wisdom. Um, philosophy in the original sense as the love of wisdom. So that's who we've gone through. And as you can see, Freud and Jung are at the center there and Kohlberg, Erickson, and now Fowler are gonna come out of those. Next week is Carol Gilligan's In a Different Voice, who is going to offer a critique of all these in terms of, um, well, does this work for girls and women? Uh, and she's going to say, no, it doesn't. Uh, and she's going to have a different voice on the subject. And then finally, we're going to end with uh, from the postmodern to the posthuman, uh, our present and future. We keep bumping up against the topic of postmodernism here, so uh, we're just going to explore it in our last session. So um, thank you for coming out on uh, a still cold night. I don't, what's happening? So weird. Um, and, pro, and to hear someone you may not have heard of, although I learned that Lou has heard of him. Lou has a great story about Mr. Fowl, Dr. Fowler. Uh, that's him. He is uh, taught for years at my alma mater, Emory University, where he was well revered. Uh, they created the Center for Ethics there uh, in, to kind of center and house his work. Uh, PhD uh, from Duke, uh, sorry, from uh, a graduate of Duke and Drew Theological Seminary, PhD from Harvard um, in Religion and Society, 1971. His most famous book was, is, Stages of Faith, the Psychology of Human Development and the Quest for Meaning. Now, I don't know if you've heard of this work, but it is a significant work. It is uh, especially referenced by people who are interested in religious development. So we've talked about everything so far in this course, or almost everything. We've talked about psychosocial development in Freud. We've talked about uh, mythological individuation in Jung. We've talked about uh, we've referenced Piaget and cognitive development and Kohlberg and moral development, but we haven't really talked about religious development, uh, and I think it's appropriate we do so now. Um, so, one of the crucial things, Stages of Faith is the book, one of the crucial things here is to understand Fowler's notion of faith. It's probably not what you think it is. So let me give you some definitions. Before his book, his 1981 book, Stages of Faith, he had another piece where he wrote this. Faith is the process of constitutive knowing underlying a person's composition and maintainment of a comprehensive frame or frames of meaning generated from the person's attachments or commitments to centers of supraordinate value which have power to unify his or her experience of the wor world, thereby endowing the relationships, contexts, and patterns of everyday life, past and future, with significance. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, I love academics. Um, all right, let's try it again. The process of constitutive knowing, okay? So it's not passive knowing, it's knowing that that is actionable, let's, let's say that, constitutive knowing, underlying a person's composition, her identity, maybe, right? So it's the process of knowing that underlies a person's identity and sustainability of a comprehensive frame of meaning. Well, we talk about that all the time here. It's, we might say, mythology, right? A story that orients you in the world 
or stories, a set of stories that orient you, orients you in the world. And this is gener generated, this, this type of knowing that underlies your identity and is, is meaning making in its nature, uh, generates from our attachments or commitments to something, to things beyond ourselves. All right, sure, that sounds right. And in doing so, this produces a sense of unity in the world, of our experiences in the world. Again, I'm gonna say mythology does that. Uh, he doesn't like that language so much, but it, it's a map. It's making a map in which you live, right? In the world, so the world is here and here I am in it. Uh, where's our cartographer? There he is, Karen, the, the UPR official cartographer. Will you make a map of meaning next time? I'm just kidding, That's, you do that next year. <laughs> All right, uh, thereby <laughs> endowing the relationships, contexts, and patterns of everyday life, past and future, with significant, significance, meaning, right? So all this is about meaning making. All right, here is the definition from stages of faith, and I think you'll see it's a little different if you can make sense of it. So the first is before the book. This is the book. In the most formal and comprehensive terms that I can state, faith is people's evolved and evolving ways of experiencing self, others, and the world as they construct them, as related to and affected by the ultimate conditions of existence and shaping their lives, purposes, and meanings trusts and loyalties in light of the character of being, value, and power, determining the ultimate conditions of existence. Let's try it again. In the most formal and comprehensive terms, faith is, so you, you, first of all, you notice what faith isn't, right? It's not some simple or, if, or complex belief in a higher being. It's not that at all for Fowler. Faith is people's evolved and evolving. First of all, I like that because we tend to approach these terms of religion and philosophy and wisdom, we tend to make them static when in fact they are dynamic almost always. So it's people's evolved and evolving ways of experiencing self, others in the world. Okay, self, others in the world, right? As they construct them. Wait, what? Faith is my way of experiencing myself in the world as I construct it? Okay, so see, we're not in the, in the simple theological terms here. And shaping, and in so doing, shaping our lives, purposes, and meanings, trust, and loyalties in light of the character of being, value, and power. All right, so there's this dialogue going on. There's this generative aspect of my interaction with the world in terms of my subjectivity, but also with an encounter uh, of objectivity, of something outside me. And faith is making sense of that. And that's, and you know that, you do that every day. You do that all the time, you have to, because consciousness is here, it's kind of centered in your body and, and your body is not everywhere, and yet your body can go different places and interact with other people and other things. Faith is the weaving of all those things into something meaningful. Conscious and unconscious, etc. All right, and then here's another one. Uh, I think this is after the book. I don't have the citation. <laughs> Faith aims to include descriptions of religious faith, as well as the less explicit faith orientations of individuals and groups who can be described as secular or eclectic in their belief and values orientations. All right, I think you see what's happening here. We are zooming way out. So we're not talking about a particular theological tradition. We're talking about an existential situation an existential way of being and knowing. That becomes very important for Fowler. And if you studied any 
um, existentialism at all, especially Christian versions of ex existentialism, you may be recognizing this language. Paul Tillich, um, <laughs> Stephen, Stephen's hero, one of Stephen's heroes, 1886 to 1965. Um, uh, Austrian, is that right? German, okay. Um, really interested in Christianity and culture. Noted for saying that God is the ground of our being. So Tillich's an existentialist theologian. He's informed by Nietzsche and Kierkegaard. Uh, and so he's, he's right in line with Fowler. In fact, Fowler is basing his notion of faith on Tillich to a large degree. Religion is that which is of ultimate concern. Well, what can be of ultimate concern? Lots of things. Your lover, your job, your favorite team. All these things, if, if you attach ultimate concern to them, they are your religion. And if you just zoom out and take that as the definition of religion, it changes the whole public discourse on religion, doesn't it? it? Drives me crazy to hear, well, it drives me crazy to watch anything on TV, but these facile notions of religion that, that people throw around just, I don't know what the point of arguing about them is because that's not what religion is. Religion is more like this. It is existential in nature, or it's, or it's not much of a religion. Right? If it doesn't affect your life, your being, here and now, what's the point of the religion? I, I guess one point would be to argue about it on Twitter. <laughs> that seems to work. Religion is the depth dimension of culture. Now, I have to say that Tillich has informed most of my work in this sense, in that Christianity and culture, religion and culture, um, are not separate. Um, H. Richard Niebuhr has a great book called Christ and Culture because that had been, and I guess still is to some degree, a crucial issue in Christianity since Augustine, who said in City of God that, uh, well, I don't want to get into City of God too much because we'll never leave, but uh, the fall of Rome was imminent. St. Augustine had identified Christianity with Rome for good reason since 313 because it was the official religion of Rome. Augustine has to rethink his whole orientation as the Visigoths come over the wall. Um, well, if Christianity isn't here in Rome in this established, not just government, but empire, then where is it? It's in heaven. It's the city of God. And therefore, we Christians, he says, are resident aliens. Uh, we don't belong here. We don't have papers here in this world. We belong in another world. Uh, and so the challenge then is to be, learn how to live in a world in which you're an alien and to which you do not belong, nor do you aspire. And this is the source of many criticisms of Christianity that, that call it too otherworldly. And so you're not, the criticism would be many Christians are not as concerned about stewardship, for example, of this world, right? Because this world isn't real. This is the world where you're, you're just temporary. You're just passing through. Um, I, I don't think that's a valid criticism for what it's worth. There are plenty of Christians who who believe the opposite, that they are, because of their faith, uh, default stewards of the earth. But the point being that from Augustine on, and yeah, from Augustine on, there was this conflict between Christianity and culture. And to participate in one was to deny the other. Um, I grew up like this in the hills of Tennessee in my Southern Baptist heritage. I remember the phrase, don't be of the world. Uh, I didn't know what that, how do you not be of the world? But of course, you know, that the point was Augustine's point. You don't wedge yourself to this world because it's not your home, ultimately. And so you, what that does is creates this incredible tension. 
right? And it, it gets expressed, for example, in Christian fundamentalism, and in other fundamentalisms, by the way, this sense that this world is not worthy of your devotion, or at least your connection, your embeddedness, it's not worthy. And so you must diminish, at the very least, diminish this world. Tillich is different from that. He believes that religion is the deepest strata of culture. Go down into culture as far as you can go, and that's the religion. That is religion. It's the depth dimension of culture, and I think that's right. Because I think, quite simply, religion is what you believe. And if you want to know, and I don't care what the content of that belief is, it may be the belief that, um, that the Cavaliers are going to beat the Warriors. Frankly, I think that's a lot of people's religion, uh, is sports now. We should do a series on that, religion and sport. Amen. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> Um, but religion is the depth dimension of culture. It's the deepest part you can go. It's the, the layer of belief and that bubbles up and informs everything, fertilic. And I think that's right. And so when I hear people say uh, things like religion is the problem with culture, I'm like, well, how are you separating religion from culture? Religion is culture at its deepest dimension. And, and what I mean by religion and what Tillich means by religion is this meaning-making process that we just read about from Fowler, this sense of you're living in, an, in a strange alien world, um, maybe an absurd world, and you have to make sense of an absurd world. And that process is inherently religious because for me, religion is a synonym, and for Tillich, religion is a synonym for meaning. So if you're making meaning, you're doing religion. Uh, he talks about the kairos, the right time for religion to kind of emerge, erupt into popular culture, into the more surface levels of culture. And he thought uh, Germany, right after World War I, was such a time. Of course, the time before that was when Jesus walked the earth. Um, <laughs> yeah, he took a lot of flack for his statement that God does not exist. Here's, here's what he said. God does not exist. He is being itself beyond essence and existence. Therefore, to argue that God exists is to deny him. Think about that. You may need to take some time with that, but it makes perfect sense to me. Because when you argue that God exists, you are arguing for a concept. And God is beyond all concepts must be right you cannot capture God in language is another way to put it and if you can then well God is no bigger than your word for God and then you start arguing over the names of God and you might even start killing over it God does not exist he is being itself beyond existence and essence being God is being. Therefore, to argue that God exists is to deny him. You can go right from there to the ancient Chinese sage Lao Tzu, who says that the Tao, the way, is older than God. Of course it is. It has to be. There has to be something beyond God. For Tillich, it's being. All right. So James Fowler... Uh, was a Methodist minister um, who taught at Emory University, like I said, for many years. And he developed these seven, really, stages of faith. And so let's just go through them. And then, uh, well, I'll, I'll show you what happens after. And I, I think we're going to have a really good discussion tonight. We always have a good discussion. But I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on how we develop as religious beings or as Tillich would say, as beings, right? So there's actually a stage zero. I kind of like that. Um, there should be a stage zero. Birth to two years. Uh, he calls this the primal or undifferentiated stage in which a child learns to rely on the goodness or badness or inconsistency of the world based on what? What have we seen in every talk? What is the child, the infant's, 
understanding of the world, but her parents, especially her mother, uh, or her mother surrogate, right? Sound familiar? It's pretty much Eric Erickson's uh, initial stage as well. It's trust versus mistrust, remember for Erickson. And this is, this is pretty basic, it has to be in the undifferentiated primal stage. Um, is the caretaker, is the person giving you care going to give it or not? If not, we have a problem at the uh, primal stage. And Erickson will say, remember, that this must be resolved somehow, eventually, and that it can be resolved, even if it's much later. All right, trust versus mistrust. So by the way, so Fowler's gonna, gonna kind of merge Kohlberg and Erickson here, which is kind of nice since we're moving through this the way we are. All right. Um, yeah. Through loving care from parents and other adults in their life, young children start to build a lived experience of trust, courage, hope, and love. At this stage, children experience faith, because remember these are stages of faith, as a connection between themselves and the caregiver. You know, maybe that's all faith ever is, <laughs> is what we have right here in stage zero. A connection between themselves and the caregiver and whether the caregiver is a person or the universe itself. I have a, my dear friend uh, will call me sometimes from Turkey where he lives and present me with a problem and I'll say, well, you just need to trust the universe. And he always says, who is this? Because <laughs> we've been through some stuff. <laughs> but now I'm saying trust the universe. <laughs> Stage one. Intuitive projective, all right? So this is an interesting stage, uh, three to seven years. Children are beginning to be able to use symbols and their imaginations. Really important stage, obviously. Uh, Self-focused, very inclined to th take things literally and self-referentially, right? Uh, ideas about evil, the devil, or other aspects of religion. Um, watch children in church. It's all about them, and I guess it should be, uh, but they don't have this sorting mechanism yet. And so everything's kind of self-referential and literal, uh, even though they're beginning to work with symbols. So, but they're un unable to think abstractly and generally unable to see outside their own perspective. So they are ready for a higher office at this, that was a joke, sorry. Um, Robert Keeley writes, these children cannot think like a scientist, consider logical arguments, or think through complex ideas. Again, politician. Um, but then faith isn't that, is it? Or you can say that it is, but then you're going to have a hard argument to make that faith is logical, rational. Um, because then where's the faith? Where's the uncertainty? Isn't faith about some level of uncertainty? We can talk about that. It's impressionistic at this stage. Um, impressions gained largely from their parents or the other adults in their lives. They, be they can become involved in ritual. Now we tend to think, like Piaget and Kohlberg, we tend to think of development as being rational or at least mind involve the mind in some sense, but we forget the importance of ritual. Our very first talk and discussion about how you put the body into culture or you put the body in religious terms in touch with the sacred and that is ritual. And children know this, they know it very well. Uh, watch them, they're fascinating. They know the importance of a ritual. In fact, try to break a child's ritual, especially a three to seven year old child. Not gonna go well for either of you. So it's interesting, they do have this sense of, uh, of, of ritual, of, of a certain way things must be done at a certain time, and of course it's centered on themselves, but that's okay, that's what ritual does, and that this is important. Now they can't articulate it, nor should they have to, but 
ritual. Uh, I think that's one of uh, Fowler's most interesting insights, is that children know ritual much earlier than we think they do. Stage two, um, six to 12 years, school age. Uh, Fowler calls it the mythic literal stage. Infor information now gets um, stored, transmitted through stories. Uh, so appropriately, the mythic stage. These stories are fairly literal and concrete still, but they are stories now. So there's a narrative involved. There's a sense of um, a progression of a beginning, a middle, and an end. Whereas before, it, it's much more um, discrete word symbols. Now the symbols are in relation. Um, now they can't step back and, and do, do an interpretation of these stories. That's all right. They shouldn't have to at 6 to 12. Uh, but there is, interestingly, I, again, this is from Kohlberg, there's a sense of justice and fairness emerging. And in fact, that's what a lot of the stories are about, aren't they? Justice and fairness. Fowler says a few people remain in this stage all their lives. Um, religiously, children at this age, they start to understand there is authority, religious authority, he says, that is, goes beyond parents and trusted adults and to others in the community. I almost said institutions, but I think that's too big a concept for this stage. Just other people, so they can go to church, they can go to temple, uh, and they can see, oh, these people are doing this and they have some sort of authority, um, along with my parents and the other adults in my life. Children begin, Fowler says, at this stage to think about their faith. Faith becomes the stories they tell and the rituals they practice. All right, stage three. Adolescence to early adulthood. Again, Fowler says some people never get out of this stage. He calls it the synthetic conventional stage in which people believe without having critically examined their beliefs. Right? We know this. We've been there. Maybe we are there. You just want to state things. <laughs> you don't want to examine the things. You don't want to defend the things you're stating. You but it's important to state them. Um, it's, it's a ritual in itself, I would say. I don't know that Fowler puts it this way, but it's a ritual in itself to say, yes, I believe that. Because you immediately are part of a community when you do that. And all you have to do is say it. You know, this is the basis of Islam, by the way, and why it spreads so easily, is all you have to do is say it. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. Done. Right? Um, there might be a few other things after that, by the way. Um, there's a strong sense of group identity here. This is sociology now moves from psychology to sociology um, to question, and they're not open to questioning because to question is to question the group, and therefore it is to question your identity, right? So you may have heard me talk about teaching at this uh, small Methodist college in Alabama, and they required Bible of all students, and I said, please don't do that, please, that's a terrible idea, because, you know, they the people who, who wanted that to happen thought it was a kind of, you know, group reinforcement, when in fact it was college. So it wasn't that at all. It was scholarship of the Bible. Uh, and so it produced this sharp break with the students and resistance among the students. And it wasn't their fault, because when I would walk into a Bible class and say, well, you know, we really don't have these texts, and the texts we do have are copies of copies of copies, and they're pretty clearly uh, problematic. I was basically saying that what their grandparents had taught them was a lie. There was just no way around that, 
because of these stages of faith, right? So I was trying to get them out of one stage and into another in a one semester course on the Bible. Was not gonna happen. Actually, it kinda did happen. At least you could plant the seeds. Uh, and, they, and I have dear friends who were in those classes even now. But it was hard. It was hard for me, it was harder for them. Uh, I was often called the Antichrist and, uh, oh yeah, anyway. Maybe I was, you know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Me and Ozzy, we got so much in common. <laughs> All right, so now that the, the simple stories and rituals get a little more depth in them, and that depth is in the form of ethics or morals. Uh, so you begin to use the stories now um, as you develop in your faith. Um, and in fact, you can start to see the world, religion, the depth dimension of culture from other people's perspective. Your group's perspective, but still, that's someone else, right? And so again, you're merging with this group identity. Um, it becomes, at this stage, your faith, and again, we're using faith in the broadest possible sense, according to Fowler. It becomes your own, even though it may look identical to your family's, right? You know the stage you've been here where um, it's like you're affirming what you've been taught, but the very fact that you are affirming it means it's yours in a way it never was, right? Um, yeah, I was gonna do Sisyphus, but we're not gonna do that yet. Um, so religious authority comes into play here um, in, in the parents, but actually more so in that expanded community of adults who have religious authority, um, including friends and other people in your group now. All right, stage four, individuative and reflective. Um, <laughs> My notes here say, the earlier in adulthood this happens, the easier it is. <laughs> um, now, your group identity becomes a prison, right? So you've attached yourself to this group, you're in a box, you put yourself there, and of course we put ourselves in boxes, boxes are relatively safe, I'm here, Everything else is out there. Most of that is bad. My box is good. I'm going to stay in this box. But then living in a box is living in a freaking box. It's not living. And so you begin to see and you begin to ask questions. You see contradictions in your communities, your group's beliefs. This is very painful. Old ideas that you grew up with. You might take Professor Salyer's New Testament class and hear about the Bible. You might think he's the Antichrist, but then you can't stop asking those questions he asks you to ask. Um, some people give up on faith, reject faith at this point. Um, but this, as I think most of this group would agree, it's also an important stage of growth. Um, so this is the dissonance that comes with real questioning. And let's be honest, again, as Fowler says, you don't have to progress through these stages. And many people don't. Um, many people I grew up with don't. And you know, that's okay, that's their life. But I know it's true of many of you that you come from homes or places where people locked in and stopped questioning, um, stopped looking for answers and stopped hearing the questions. And that's okay for their life, but what happens when you have to keep asking the questions and keep seeking for answers? You are inherently a threat to these people, these people who were your group where you got cookies, and, and now you don't get any more cookies. 
because you're asking uncomfortable questions. Um, <laughs> um, and so what else happens? You start to question the authority structures that had created the group in the first place, the church, the temple, the mosque, etc. So this is usually a time you leave. This is when you begin your own search. Um, and, you know, you may come back. A lot of people come back. A lot of people come back to that original faith, uh, and I mean faith in a narrow sense here, Presbyterianism, Catholicism, whatever. They come back to that, renewed very often. Um, having been on a quest, on a journey, they can now see perhaps deeper into that tradition and see it more than, see it as more than a box but as perhaps a depth dimension of culture. This is the existential moment where the journey becomes yours. You're no longer relying on anyone else. You must find your own way. Stage five, uh, usually not before midlife, the conjunctive stage, which is a person who's gone through the deconstruction. That's really not the right word to use there. The dissolution of the individuative reflective stage begins to let go, I love these notes here, begins to let go of some of the reliance on their own rational mind and recognize that some experiences are not logical or completely understandable at all. So it's a very common uh, response to, to seeing through, to seeing outside of your box, to seeing through the the logical and rational holes in your faith community and adopting instead a severe rationality. Right? I, I think this is what the new atheists do, uh, Hitchens and um, Dawkins and these guys. I love watching them debate, debate people. Um, it's just fascinating to me, but, but you know, if you want to live rationally, um, there's a way to do that. I mean, you live by numbers, you live by logic. I don't know anybody who really can do that or wants to do that. You know, even Spock had, uh, he had feelings. He just tried to deal with them. And don't even talk about Ponfar, because that's a whole other thing, right? Um, maybe this is just me, but, but this was my response when I lost my faith is, is to become overly rational. Now, I'm not knocking rationality, we need it. God, God us knows we need it more than ever. But you can depend on an ism, any kind of ism, too much, including rationalism. Because it's, not, it's only gonna take you so far. In fact, I think any ism is only gonna take you so far. Because otherwise you stop being a seeker and you start being a finder. And uh, when you found it, I don't know what's left. Maybe that's just me. Maybe I just haven't found it yet. But um, it, you'll, see, you'll see this on Twitter a lot. I really try to cultivate my Twitter feed, but I think it's almost impossible to weed out everything. But you'll see the a lot of Twitter criticism on any side of any issue about this lack of rationality on the other side, right? Okay, great. Uh, I'm all for exposing logical fallacies. Now what? Now where do we go? Okay, you're an idiot. I just showed that you're an idiot right here on Twitter in front of everybody. Now what? Now what do we do? Um, so anyway, And that's why at this stage, Fowler says, you've got to move beyond your resistance to the previous stage. So there's the previous stage, this is very Hegelian, I'm now realizing. There's the previous stage, the thesis, and then there's the antithesis, the opposite, and then you've got to find some sort of synthesis. 
You've got to bring those, it's Jung, right? You've got to integrate. And to individuate is to integrate your experiences and your personas and yourselves. At this point, people are, well, frankly, they're a lot like you, if I may be so bold. They're more interested in other people's paths, other people's religions, philosophies, ways of knowing and being in the world. And so they may even come out on a Tuesday night to hear someone talk about these things. It's an interesting place to be. Um, all right. Almost no one gets to stage six. Sorry. Uh, it's not a very good video game if you can't get to stage six. But Fowler says almost no one does. He's talking about Mother Teresa, Gandhi, people like that. It's seeing all of humanity as one brotherhood or sisterhood and taking profound self-sacrificing action to care for humanity because of this perspective. Fowler says that people at this stage have a special grace that makes them seem more lucid, more simple, and yet somehow more fully human than the rest of us. People at this stage become important religious teachers because they have the ability to relate to any stage from any faith, right? That's what we seek here. We seek to have that perspective. That's what Manley Hall taught nearly a century ago, is that the more perspectives, the better, right? The, the wider you see, the longer you see, the deeper you see, the more perspectives. People at this stage genuinely cherish life and don't hold on too tightly. I like that. They don't hold on too tightly. Um, yeah, we can talk about that if you want. They put their faith in action and so they are not, they do not withdraw from the world. They are in fact part of the resistance uh, to tyranny and anything that promotes inauthenticity, they will work against that. Um, yeah, their faith is not simply cerebral or internal. It is, they put their body into action at this stage. Again, almost no one gets here. Karen might be here, I don't know. All right, so around the time that Fowler was writing, there was another person who was saying some very similar things. I don't know if you know this person, uh, M. Scott Peck. Does that sound familiar? wrote a book called The Road Less Traveled and The Different Drum. And uh, I happened to, to be working at a community mental health center when this book came out and it was all the rage. And it was really profound because it was, well, because he was integrative and interdisciplinary. He was culling insights from Buddhism and Hinduism and Christianity and talking about the American in particular the American stages along life's way. And so he, you can pretty much map these onto Fowler. And so Fowler had six or seven, um, and f basically these map pretty clearly onto that chaotic antisocial. All right, that's chaos is an infant. <laughs> antisocial is a two. Uh, Formal, institutional, rules-based, skeptic, individual, mystical, communal, right? So, um, and Peck's special insight, I think, or at least what resonated among my group when we were reading it was that um, you could go backwards, <laughs> you could regress, or you could never get out of the chaotic antisocial stage, right? People in, in stage one are self-centered, find themselves in trouble due to their unprincipled living. I'm looking at you, two-year-old. You need to get your stuff together. Uh, if they do end up converting to the next stage, it's often very dramatic. Kierkegaard would call this the aesthetic stage, if you remember. Very dramatic, 
very uh, stirring up a lot of things uh, as, the, as he does in stages on life's way. Formal institutional. At this stage, people rely on some sort of institution, such as just church, to give them stability. I was working in, living in Tennessee at this time, my home state, and I'm like, I'm like oh my God, of course. Uh, I grew up across the street from a Baptist church. If you've ever lived in the South, the church, Protestantism in particular, um, is in the air and water. It's part of the culture. It's so woven into the culture, you can't really separate the, the threads. And so they become attached to this institutional way of being and knowing and to threaten the institution in any way is to threaten their identity. Skeptic individual and so okay those who break out of the formal institutional stage start questioning and may reject utterly the previous stage or just leave it alone. Usually you don't just leave it alone that requires a certain level of maturity that is usually not available at this stage. I know it wasn't for me. You have to vociferously reject the previous stage. You can't just say, ah, oh, that's not working for me anymore. You have to deny it. And then finally, the mystical communal stage, um, where again, and this is like the epigenetic principle of, um, of Piaget and Kohlberg and, and all these other psychologists is that Every stage contributes to your identity, to how you become who you are. And so the mystical communal stage involves looking back over those stages and seeing where you've come from and understanding that that's a part of you, even if you reject it. Again, this is Jung, integration, individuation. Um, and to understand that life can be paradoxical and full of mystery. That's a hard place to get to, isn't it? Hard place to get, I think I'm getting there, but I think it's because I'm just so tired. Uh, so I'm like, yeah, okay, I don't know. That's a paradox. Um, I, I'm just being a little dramatic. Um, Kierkegaard said, paradox is not a concession, it's a category. And frankly, that's how we live. And, and this is the failure of the rational, the overly rational mind, right? Is you cannot let a paradox stand if you're overly rational. But in fact, paradox is, a concession, is not a concession. It's a way of being and knowing. And so when you're here at this stage, you recognize the power and virtue of community, of this, right? Of being able to share your path with other people, even if they're on different paths. At least you're at the point where you're, you can talk about the paths you're on. And that's a great blessing, a wonderful grace. And so I wanted to give you a world religions perspective on this because that's what I teach a lot. And I, I would start by saying that, well, let me just do the world religions perspective. Rudolf Otto's Mysterium Tremendum et Fascinans says uh, religion is based on a feeling of tremendous mystery and fascination. It's an experience of tremendous mystery and fascination, the holy other, the completely other. Um, and if you look at the world's religions, especially in the West, you will see that this is the beginning. Uh, it's Abram walking through Ur and being tapped on the shoulder by Yahweh and saying, needs you to come over here. It's Moses uh, who is, <laughs> who reluctantly agrees to free his people from slavery in Egypt. Uh, it is Zoroaster, it is uh, Jesus, it is Paul, uh, it is Muhammad. Um, a feeling of tremendous mystery and fascination. And so, what do you do with that? It is so idiosyncratic, it is so unique to yourself. In fact, it is dangerous um, because uh, it's so different. Different is always dangerous. And so if you go around telling people that Allah dictated to you uh, his word in Arabic, you better be careful. You know, 
because you're going to inherently upset the existing order. And so that requires revolution. And for revolution, you're going to need some help. And so you need some followers. And these are hard to come by. Muhammad's first follower was Khadija, his wife. Always a good start. Um, eventually, he developed a few more. And of course, immediately, they were thrust into tribal warfare in the Arabian desert. Eventually, however, acculturation. You learn to live with the dominant culture. You may even influence the, the dominant culture in some way. And then assimilation. You are the dominant culture. Most obviously here, we're, we can see Christianity, which begins as a weird Jewish sect in uh, the Roman Empire. It becomes dangerous. Its leader is crucified by the Romans. Uh, its followers scatter, meet in houses, um, under threat all the time, apostles mostly executed, martyred, Peter, Paul. But then, you know, they keep hanging around. And so then they're there and they're kind of part of it, of the culture. And then one day, a Roman general named Constantine uh, sees a vision of a cross over a battlefield in which he's supposed to lose by all rational means and he ends up winning. And so Christianity becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire, assimilation. Now, historically, we should not make too much of Constantine. I think he was being politically expedient, but it doesn't matter in the big picture because Christianity becomes the official religion of Rome. Now it is the culture. It initially was a victim of the culture, and now it is the culture. And so what happens, and, and this again is based on the religions of the world have, as they have developed, is you need an ethics. In fact, as soon as the founder dies, you need an ethics. You need an ethical code. Because without the founder, you don't know what to do. Again, think of Jesus and his disciples, and they're so clueless. They're just so stupid. Wait, are you saying you're actually bread? I don't understand, Jesus. What, are you a door? How, how are you a door? They just don't get it. Um, and so he leaves them their teaching, his teaching. And that teaching quickly becomes ethical codes. Um, I may get these numbers wrong, but the Buddha within a year of his death, within, yeah, a year of the Buddha's death, there were four major sects of Buddhism. Within a few years, there were 16. Why? Because the founder's gone. And he, I'm sorry, it's always he uh, so far, uh, is the center. And he is more symbolic. He, he tells parables, and so you're never quite sure what he means. But without that, without that teaching, you need thou shalt and thou shalt not. That's what you've got to have. And that develops. And then, of course, once you're at the assimilation stage in culture, then those ethics become law. And pretty soon, culture is the religion. And there are people in this country who would love for that to happen with Christianity right now. And they have always been in this country, by the way. It's always been a tension in America as to whether it's a theocracy or a democracy. Anyway, enough of that. Um, and then pretty soon, sometimes, maybe often, what follows is colonization. If you have the truth and if you have the culture, then you might as well take what's left, right? Especially if you have the power, all right? So, James Fowler, Stages of Faith, thank you for your attention.